is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Well, hi there, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. As we continue on in the study that we started last week in the letter to James. So we'll be picking that right up, and uh, I, I'm going to start at verse 6, first chapter, verse 6. Okay. But before I do that, I'm going to ask Alice if you would play, pray, play, <laughs> hallelujah. It's a joy to pray. It is. Pray for God's blessing on our time together. Lord, we just <clears throat> come before you, Father, with humble hearts, Amen. and we ask you, Lord, to just speak to us and let your words come through our mouth. Anoint Alan in the word that you want him to bring forth. And when that word we know, Lord, will go out and touch and do it and accomplish what you want it to do to those who are listening. Amen. Amen. So be listening. Listening. Be careful what you listen to, as Jesus said. Yes. But when, it's, when you're listening to what Jesus wants you to listen to, make sure that you are indeed listening. All right? And I might suggest to you that you have your Bible handy. It's a, it is, after all, a Bible study. You may want to have something to take any, any notes so you can jot down something that strikes you, something that you want to question or, or what have you. Just be prepared to do the study, all right? Okay. All right, so as I said, we were talking about, in the first chapter we just started last week, and we were talking about wisdom, right? How God gives wisdom, all right? And if you don't have wisdom, if you lack wisdom, then you're supposed to ask God to give it to you. And he will. But, well, here's what it says in verse 6, James 1, 6. Mm -hmm. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. And for that man ought not to expect that he'll receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you've ever been out to sea, but I'll tell you what, when I start bouncing around, there's, there's no consistency. Yeah. We need consistency in our lives. We don't need to be double-minded. Double-minded, yeah. okay? um, double by the way, I mean, there's a, there's a technical term for that. It's called schizophrenia. <laughs> it is. It's a mental disorder. It's, a mental, right. it's a mental disease. So if you're, if you're trusting God right now and then you stop trusting God, you're dealing with a mental disorder. Which, by the way, is a natural state of man, which is why the prophet Isaiah, God spoke to Isaiah to say the whole head is sick. Mm, yes. Okay. I mean, the world is the world operates under a mental disorder. Okay. You can't. You can't afford to do that. So you have to be prayerful and careful that you don't allow that disorder to take place or have place in your life. All right. Don't be double-minded. Don't be double-minded. Don't believe in God this minute and then disbelieve in God this, this minute. You either believe him or not. You know, faith is, is not somebody, it's, faith is not a feeling. Faith is not positive thinking. Faith is about a choice. And the choice is, are you going to believe what God has said? Because if you're not believing what God has said, who are you believing? Amen. Who are you believing? I mean, are you believing your feelings? Are you believing the world? Are you believing? Because any of those things, whether you're believing your feelings or the world, you're listening to the enemy, the enemy of our spirits. You're listening to the, to the serpent who deceived Eve. So you have to fix your mind on Jesus Christ. You have to fix your mind on the things of God. You have to choose to believe the word of God. It doesn't mean that you're always going to feel like it. You know, I, I can remember preaching years ago in a, in a little Pentecostal church in the, in the Bronx in New York, many years ago, as a matter of fact. And there was this group of women that used to go into, I'm talking about the South Bronx, back in the 70s. It was a war zone. Which literally, I mean, it was a war zone. Yes. There wasn't a light on, uh, all this, the, the street lights had been shot out. I mean, most of the buildings were half burned out. And they would go out to witness to people at night. Yes. In the darkness of that place, that's operating in faith. Yeah. But you know what? You better hear from God before you operate Absolutely. in faith. Because if you're operating on your own, leaning on your own understanding, you're in, you, you're in trouble. All right. <clears throat> but the fact is, I said, because I've had the opportunity to, to preach in places like that, I said, if you were coming down in a dark, and you turn into a dark alley in the South Bronx at midnight, and you look down the street, and there's a bunch of guys standing at the end of the street, and they don't look 
like it's the Rotary Club meeting. You know, you may be at the, the, this end of that valley and you have a choice to make now, right? The choice is not about whether you're going to go or stay. The choice is, are you going to believe God that your life is not in danger? Their life is in danger. Your life is assured if you believe in Jesus Christ. You have no fear. Fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. Yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death or down an alley in the Bronx, if you're with the Lord, you're safe and secure from all alarm. So it's that choice you have to make. That doesn't mean that your body's going to be obedient to that. Your body, you may have to walk down that street with knees and knocking because you have the right to take command of your body. Your spirit has the right to take command of your body and say, we're going to do this. That doesn't mean that your body's going to like it. But I promise you that as you go, with each step, you will gather, you'll gather courage in the name of the Lord. Okay. And that, and You'll that be encouraged. Fear, that fear will flee. It will. That, that the fear Holy will flee. Move in there. But don't listen to your flesh. I mean, your flesh is cahoots with the devil. Your spirit is what's alive in in in, in companionship, in combination with the spirit of God. Okay. United. So, you know, and but listen, let's be God loves honesty. You know, but honestly, remember the account in the Gospel of Mark when Jesus had come down a hillside and there was a man there whose son had been tormented by demons. Remember this? Mm -hmm. And the man says to Jesus, you know, nobody's been able to deal with this. Uh, your, your, your apostles, they couldn't do anything. And so the man asked Jesus, if you can help, if you can do anything. And Jesus, I'm paraphrasing, said, if I can do anything. But the man said, so Jesus said to the man, do you believe that I can do this? And the man said, yes, Lord, I believe. Help my disbelief, my unbelief. Be honest with God. I'm telling you, he's always honest with you. But don't be ruled by the feelings of your flesh. Be led by the spirit of God. Okay, so I'm not going to go anywhere. All right. Because you won't receive anything from the Lord. You, you, have to, you have to have an assurance that God is faithful. I mean, that's what made Paul the man that he was, because he had an absolute assurance that God, who had placed his own son on a cross for Paul's sake, there was nothing good that he would withhold from Paul. Not a thing. Mm -mm. You should have that exact same assurance in your life. All right. We have to trust him. So don't be double-minded. Remember, that's a mental disorder, okay? Be, ha, fix, your, fix your mind on Christ. Fix your mind on the things above. If you feel that you're drifting from that, then you can, as the scripture says, take thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. You have the power to say to your flesh, shut up, flesh, and speak the word of God to yourself to build faith in your life. Okay. And it goes on in verse 9 to say, But a brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. Doesn't that sound like a contradiction to you? Mm -hmm. Humble circumstances, high position. Mm -hmm. No. James started this letter by introducing himself as a bondservant of Christ. A bondservant? Well, you know what? It's That's a high a, position. It's, it's the high position if you appraise it spiritually. Mm -hmm. There is no greater position that you can have than to serve the living God, to serve the Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. The King of Kings. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. The King of Glory. Hallelujah. Amen. There's no higher position than you can have in it. But the world doesn't see a servant as a high position. No. no. I mean, even the apostles, think about this on the night that he was taken when they had the Last Supper. And Jesus took water, a bowl of water and a cloth, and started to wash the feet of his disciples. That pretty much freaked Peter out. He said, no, Lord, no, you can't do this. He didn't recognize that as a high position, but this is a Jesus, this is the King of Kings, who said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. And that's the high position. That's the high position. To serve. 
So if you get it in your head that the highest thing, the most important thing, the greatest thing that you can do is to serve God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your might, by being an obedient servant, you found the truth. You are a high position. But then, because think about this, and in verse 10, he says, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation. Because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and the flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too, the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. It seems like even in the church, so much of the church is focused on gaining riches. Because that, you know, it seems like, well, that's the approval of the world. Or you think that's, uh, that's showing the approval of God. Well, that's what the world promotes. That's what the world promotes, whether it's dressed in religious robes or... or so we've got, we've got to get this thick. There's so much teaching and training in Scripture on the danger of riches. And you know, because you said too, that that's what the church is portraying also, the riches. But they've allowed the world to come in. Well, and they've taken on that doctrine of the world. That's why you have to test all things and hold fast that which is good. I mean, it seems to me that the fastest growing churches in the world are the ones that are prosperity preaching mm -hmm. and saying, God wants to give you, God wants to give you, God wants to give you. Instead of trying to get you to the place where you understand that you want, you want to give to God, that you mm -hmm. want to give to God. You want to be bond It's upside down. It's backwards. It's wrong. It's, it's, it's evil. Riches will pass away. You know, Job said, I came into this world naked, naked, I'm going out. You, you're not going to gain anything on this world and have riches in this world that you can take with you to heaven. You can, however, take the true riches and send them on ahead. Store up your treasures. Store up your treasures in heaven. Because mm -hmm. there, you know what? The moth can't get to it. The, the thieves can't get to it. And you don't, you don't have to choose, I want, I want to be poor. You don't have to do that. It's well, you all have, about attitude. It's all, but it is all about, it's, everything is all about attitude. Yeah. But it's about that attitude that you have. I mean, why, why do you think? The most beautiful teaching in the entire Word of God, in my opinion, I was going to say my humble opinion. It's not my opinion. I'm telling you this is what the Spirit of God has said to me. The most important teaching is the teaching of Jesus Christ in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 on the Sermon on the Mount. Why do you think that he started by saying, started this by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit? Because when you come to understand that being poor in spirit makes you accessible to all of the riches of God. Because you know, no matter what you have, no matter what you own, I mean, look in the car in your garage, look at the house that you live in, no matter, you don't own it. That's right. That's For the right. earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It all belongs to him. God has never desired for us to have ownership. He, he created man and he put him in the garden to cultivate it. So he gave man stewardship. His stewardship of the garden and he gave him possession of the garden, mm -hmm. but he didn't give him ownership of the garden. Mm -hmm. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We seem to have such a, a, a passion to own things in this world. Like it's a sign of success. It's like a sign of, is, is it a sign of God's blessing? No way, no how. But even Satan offered everything to Jesus Christ. Well, I think that was the first major prosperity message. Absolutely. Said to Jesus, if you just bow down and serve me, all these riches, all the riches of these kingdoms you can have. And you know what Jesus said? Get thee behind me, Satan. So be, just be prayerful and be careful what you listen to. That's not my saying. That's Jesus' saying. That's right. But don't, don't let riches become the goal of your life. Our goal has to be pleasing God because the only measure of success is on the day that you come and face to face oh, with Jesus, man. that you hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. servant. Okay. okay, verse 12. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You gotta persevere under trial. You know, and there's a plan for that. James started with that plan. 
He said, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Rejoice in it. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It's not when things are going as you think that they're going well. All the time. I've said this so many times because it's so true. And we need to hear it over and over. God has a plan for victory. And that plan is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That we are to rejoice always. To pray without ceasing. To give thanks in all things. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. And then don't quench the Holy Spirit. Trust God. Praise God. Rejoice in him. Tell people what a wonderful God you serve. It doesn't matter what the circumstance looks like. Because I'll tell you what. God is at work. Sometimes God's work doesn't look from the outside like the best thing going on. Which may be the very case going on in our world today. But it's God at work. Amen. Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. To accomplish what he wants to accomplish. You should be given thanks in all things. Not the things you like. All things. Because we know the end of the matter is better, better than, than its beginning. beginning. Amen. <clears throat> so if you, if you believe that and you understand that, that should make it easy for you to persevere under trial. Because you know what? You know there's an end. Yes. When I was a little child, I'll tell you what, I think I was like a lot of little children. I, mean, I, I, I may have had some extra situations. I mean, I had polio when I was a child. And I felt like a pincushion because every day when I was in the hospital, every single day, the first thing that they would start, they would come in, they'd stab me, and they would draw a gallon or two or three gallons of blood. I don't remember. I was too young. That's what it felt know. like. That's what it felt like. And I felt like a pincushion. And golly, I have to tell you, I, was, I didn't like that one bit. Sure. When I went into the military, you know, I went into the Navy, I, I flew in the Navy, when I went into the Navy, the first thing they do is they make you feel like a pincushion. I mean, you walk down the line, stab, stab, stab. I mean, they jab you all over the place. But I had matured. That didn't mean that the needles felt any better. But I realized that it would pass. This too it's shall momentary. pass. It's a momentary light affliction. Yeah. And when you understand that, when you understand that God is at work, to will and to work his pleasure, and whatever is going on is a momentary light affliction, which cannot compare to the eternal way to glory, as he said. So then, you know, you should be able to persevere. Press on. Press on. Keep on going. Don't let anything stop you. Don't let anything slow you down. Having done all, stand. Stand. Amen, sister. All right. For once he's been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The crown of life. That's the reward. That's the reward. Yes. And you know what? I want to just talk for a second about worship. Because to receive that crown of life, to receive that blessing, to receive that approval of God must be the most joyous thing that a person, a man or a woman or child can experience in their lives. But if you look in, in Revelation chapter 4, which is the first picture of history after the church period, right? Right. It talks about the elders. And you know what they're doing? They are falling on their faces before God and tossing their crowns before the throne. Giving back to him the thing that should be most precious to us. That, my friend, is worship. It's not the slow song in the middle of the fast songs. Giving all to God. Surrendering all to God. Trusting in him. Loving him. That's worship. Okay. So, in verse 13 it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one when but, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by lust. Don't confuse temptation with testing. The purpose of testing is to build faith, to perfect your faith. Okay, that's testing. Temptation, the purpose of temptation is to get you to fail. Right. Satan tempts us to try and get us to fall, to try and get us to fail. To get us off that narrow path. To get us off that narrow path. God tests us to perfect us. Mm -hmm. You know, Job said, when I, I know that when I have been tried, I shall come forth as fine gold. So don't, don't look at these trials in the, in the world as something bad, which is why you can give thanks in them, because you know that it's still God at work in you. For his purpose... I mean, he doesn't do everything in, everything in the world just, just to please us. 
You know, he does. His promises, and one of the glorious promises in Psalm 23 is that he leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Not for our sake, but for his name's sake. Trust him. Believe in him. Believe in his love for you. I was just going to read, um, but you made me think of this scripture in Second Chronicles uh, 16.9. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Completely his. So he is out there searching our hearts to see yes. who's, who's trusting him. Yes, he's not looking at your outside circumstances. Uh, he, he searches the heart. I mean, that's exactly what he said to Samuel. To those who are completely his, that's surrendering all. And you know what? There's no other way to be than to be completely his. Right. I mean, the foremost command. Somebody came to him and said, what is the foremost command? And you know what he did? He quoted in Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love him with, go read it. Most, some, no, all. Okay, each one is tempted, it says in 14, when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. You have to be careful of lust. I mean, James will talk a lot about that in this letter as we go along. And, you know, I just did a teaching recently, and I talked about the fact, this is something that God showed me, that lust is, that's the killer. Yes. It leads to war. Where does war come from? It comes from our lust. But the fact is, it's not, it's not wrong to look at something. You have to. you got to keep your, your eyes. eyes. Right? Yeah. Right? I mean, well, you have to. You have to be careful. If you're driving down the road. You better be looking at the other traffic. You better be looking at the other cars. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. Even though you can do that, and at the same time, I promise you, fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, who is the author and finisher, the perfecter of your faith. I promise you. So if I'm driving down the highway or the motorway or whatever, and I'm, I'm keeping an eye on traffic to be safe, mm -hmm. which is what you should do, right? And I look over and I see a new Ferrari mm -hmm. right next to me. And we're both putting along at 10 miles an hour under the speed limit. <laughs> Show him about spending money. <laughs> but the fact is, I have all my life, I've always liked, I, I like sports cars. I like cars. Mm -hmm. I used to love cars. Mm -hmm. And I used to be addicted to them. I mean, I would swap between sports cars and luxury cars and go back and forth and back and forth. And that was, it was, and it was like an addiction in my life. Which never, never satisfied. Never satisfied. Okay. Amen. That's, a, that's absolutely the truth. So if I look at that Ferrari and think, you know, that's really a nice looking car. Because it is. Huh? I've not seen. No. So it's all right to look. It's all right to like it. Right. The danger comes when you go to that next L, which is to linger. And I can't get my eyes off of that. And before you know it, as I'm staring at that because I, I'm lingering on it, then all of a sudden I begin to picture what it would be like for me to own that. What I would look like in the, in the seat of that car. That's when lust happens. When you, so you can look, you can like. The danger starts when you begin to linger because that will lead to lust. And lust leads to war. James says that. Mm. It's, it, I'm not just talking about you shooting at a, at a worldly enemy. No. It's a war between your spirit and your flesh. Gosh, the battle that we deal, deal with every day. And you don't have to. All you have to do is don't be enticed. You know, Satan it's has tempting. to... Yeah. We're walking that straight and narrow path that leads to eternal life. Mm -hmm. Satan has to get you off that path. Yes. He's not allowed on it. He's not, he's not allowed on that. He can't walk on the path of righteousness. So he has to get you off of it. How can he get you off? By setting snares and traps alongside it with the things that will attract you and try and draw you off. How does he know what bait to use? Because we tell him. If I'm sitting around and I say, oh, boy, I sure like those Ferraris. I like those Ferraris. Hmm. What do you think Satan is going to bait the trap with? The Ferrari. Be careful, I said, be careful what you listen to. Be more careful what you speak. Okay. Okay. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. That's a simple, simple statement. If you go from that process 
of looking to liking to lingering to lust, it leads to sin. It, not, it doesn't say it may lead to sin. This is a statement of fact. It will lead to sin in your life. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. It is still true today, and it hasn't changed. The cross did not change this. The wages of sin are death. That's the truth. It's only, somebody's got to die. Blood has to be shed. That's the word of God. There is no atonement without the shedding of blood. Any sin that you've been forgiven of, any sin that's been washed away from your life has been washed away by the shed blood of Jesus Christ on that cross. It was put to death. For us. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. All of the good things in life come from God the Father. Your boss isn't going to give them to you at work. The government's not going to give them to you. Nobody's going to give you those good things that are good and lasting and eternal except for God the Father. Mm -hmm. And the greatest gift that he has given is his son, Jesus Christ. And you should be giving thanks for that. When? Always. Always. All the time. All the time. Give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Not when things look good to you, no matter what they look like, give thanks. Rejoice. I mean, you know, James wasn't the only one to say that. Paul said, we exult in our tribulations. When those bad things happen to us, we're saying, hallelujah, go God, go. Peter is the same thing. You know, we, we have to get this idea that we are safe in the palm of his hand. We are safe and secure. God has us covered. He goes before us and he is our rear guard. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Comes to the place, the enemy should be afraid of you. When Jesus encountered demons, who got all shook up? Jesus or the demons? The demons. The demons. You know, there's the account of the sons of Sceva in, Acts, in the book of Acts. These seven sons of this, this priest Sceva. And they had seen what was happening with the Apostle Paul, the miracles he was doing, the power that he had. So there was a demon-possessed man, and these sons, seven sons of Sceva went in, and they said, we cast you out in the name of the one that Paul's preaching. And that's, that demon grabbed the seven of them up and beat them silly, beat them up. And you know what he said? He said, I know Jesus Christ. Paul I know about, but who are you? And beat them up. Why do you think, I know why they knew Jesus. They had been with him yes. at the beginning of time, before they rebelled and they fell heard like, about Paul. like true stupid heads. They had heard about Paul. How did they hear about Paul? I'm going to tell you, I believe this with all my heart. I believe that the other demons were running around saying, boy, if you run across that Paul, you better watch out. Yeah. You know, I, we, just, we did a Bible by recently talking about in Acts 28 when Paul was shipwrecked on the island of Malta. Yeah. And he was bitten by a serpent, a, a viper that the people around him knew to be death-dealing viper, right? It was poisonous. So Paul shook him off and kept on going. Why? Because he knew the power. He knew the love. He knew that assurance that he had of God that nothing could happen to him that God didn't allow. And that all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And Jesus did say, no poison will harm you. Absolutely. He said, we have authority over serpents and scorpions. They don't have authority over us. I'm not supposed to give testimonies here. I don't want to lie. But I'll tell you, you know, Alice and I spent time, we spent a couple of years, and we lived down in the, in the jungles in Central America doing missionary work down there. And we lived out in the bush. And it was not uncommon. Now, we're both from New York City. And we're both city kids. But it was not uncommon at all for us to wake up in the night and have scorpions in bed with us or have a snake swirling around. Uh, in, in the camper. And you don't get used to that. But the simple fact of the matter was, God gave us total and absolute peace. Absolutely. We had peace all through this. And all those times, and I don't know if you know what, what you know about scorpions. All those times, I mean, literally, we had scorpions in bed with us. We never got stung once. No, not once. No. Never got bit by a snake. Although, I have to tell you, a couple, struck at me. Yeah. couple of them tried. But that's, you either believe God's word or you don't believe God's word. And what's the worst thing that can happen to you? 
They kill you to death. Oh, hallelujah. To live is Christ, to die is gain. That's not the worst thing that can happen to you because you cannot die. Amen. Boy, you know, let me just say, yeah. unless you're wavering in your faith and you're thinking, oh, I might die, I might die. Get it, get it, get it into your head. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Jesus Christ said, if you believe in me, though you die, yet shall you live. And I was just thinking about the fact that being in the jungle, if, if it wasn't, if it was on our own accord that we went there and tried to settle and do this. We'd be long dead. We would, we would have been <laughs> eaten by the, the lions and the tigers and the bears, whatever they are. And the wee wee ants. <laughs> and the wee wee ants, yeah. I mean, but it was God that put us there, so he kept us safe from and everything. Absolutely. It was amazing. Amen. I mean, okay, I, I want to end on this end, talking about in Acts chapter 7 with Stephen. And if you know the account of Stephen, who had been selected by the, the church to become a, a, a cable server, a waiter in the church, that obviously wasn't God's plan because, you know, as soon as that happens, you see him out preaching the gospel and working in power. And he preaches what is probably the most complete sermon on the history of the Jewish people, on the history of the people of God ever in Acts chapter 7. And because of that, the Jews killed him. They stoned him to death. And Saul of Tarsus was there helping. But he looked up into the sky and he saw, he looked up above and saw into the, into the glory of God. His face was radiant. You know what? That's the worst they can do to you. Trust in God. Don't waver. Don't be schizophrenic. Don't believe this now and that later. Be fixed on the things of God. Get stay into, fast. stay in the word. Let the word change you to become more and more like Jesus Christ, your Lord. That's God's plan. So let me end on this verse. For this is the great promise of scripture. For whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. That's you. That's me. That's the way the story is going to look. It doesn't matter what happens in the middle. The end of a matter is better than the beginning. It doesn't talk a lot about the middle. So you know what the beginning was. Now you know what the end is. Rejoice. Give thanks. Praise him. Persevere. Press on. Forgetting what lies behind. And be with us again next week <laughs> as we continue on in this study in the letter of James. It's been a blessing to be with you. Uh, share this with others. You know, and as I say, if you have questions or comments, Write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. We'd love to hear from you. If not for any other reason to find out where you're where you're seeing this from, where you where you are. We praise God for your presence here at this study. So Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, above all, for the gift of your Son Christ Jesus, who is the Word, the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. We thank you for your word, which changes us, which molds us, melts us and molds us into what you desire us to be. Lord, help us to stand strong. You said that the righteous are as bold as a lion. Help us, Lord, to be strong in you and the strength of your might. Help us, Lord, to stand in your word and not be shaken, not be moved. We praise you and thank you for the victory that you give us, that it might be a testimony to the love of Jesus Christ in our lives. So. Until next week, God bless you and goodbye, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.